Good morning. I want to welcome you to our live stream of edition of worship at Blacksburg Baptist Church. Thanks to the coronavirus, we are not gathering here at the church for worship today. We are gathering via our website to be able to worship together virtually. We are thankful that we have this opportunity and this capability to do this. I am sad that we can't be here, and I am sad that this virus has invaded our world, but before we begin worship today, I wanted to say a couple of things to everyone who will be joining us for worship. Number one, try not to be afraid during all of this that's happening to our world right now. Yes, it is a dangerous virus that is out there, but so is the flu. And we weather that storm every single year. And so I ask you to take this virus seriously and to be very, very careful, particularly if you have health problems. But I also want to remind you that God loves you and he's on your side and he believes in you and he wants to give you the best in life. And so approach God with faith, make the best choices that you know how to make to protect yourself. And let's believe that God is for us and that he is not going to walk away from us in this storm that we are facing. The second thing is that wherever we are and whatever we are doing, God is there with us. And when we gather with him, even if we are gathering virtually, God will bless what we offer him and he will love us for trying to worship him. And so today we have gathered here to worship God and to offer him the very best that we have to offer. Before we begin today, I want, to, I want all of us to join together in a time of prayer. I want us to pray for the world. I want us to pray for everyone who is suffering with this virus. And I want us to pray that Jesus will make himself known to us because he has promised that he would do so if we would make ourselves known to him. Let's pray together. Holy God, I do thank you for this day. I thank you for this time that we can gather together. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your hope. I thank you for the blessings that come to us. We can't always control what a virus is going to do or when one is going to appear or what the genes in our body will do to mutate, to attack us instead of bless us. But what we can do is we can bring our worries and our cares and our frustrations to you. And we can know that we are approaching a God who loves us and who believes in us and who wants the best for us and who will be there to strengthen us in whatever situation we find ourselves. Help us, Lord, to make a commitment to be a blessing to others, particularly during this time of crisis. The world is afraid of this coronavirus and it has a right to be so. We have a right to be afraid, but we do not have a right to give up. So help us, God, to come to you, to believe in you, to trust your grace and your strength. Help us to try to be the best that we can be for you today and every day. Come to us today, Lord Jesus, and be pleased with what we offer you in our worship. For it is in your name we offer our prayer. Amen. Our current sermon series is called Easter Upside Down, and the focus of this series is how Jesus took the upside down values of the world and he turned them upside down to make them right side up or to make them look more like what God had always wanted them to look like. Last week's sermon was about how Jesus went to a dinner at his friend's house, Lazarus's house, the man who he had brought back from the dead. And while he was there, Lazarus's sister Mary came in with some very expensive perfume. It would have cost almost a year's salary. And she took that perfume and she poured it on Jesus' feet and she dried his feet with her, her hair. She did that because she wanted to show Jesus how much she loved him. She wanted to show Jesus how thankful he, she was for all that he had done for her and her family. And she wanted to make sure that his body was anointed for burial before he died. Or to put it a different way, she wanted to make sure that Jesus knew that she loved him and she wasn't going to wait until his death to try to do that. She wanted to basically send Jesus flowers before his funeral. 
She wanted him to know that he was special. He was the most special occasion that had ever come, had come to her life. And she wanted to make sure that he knew that. There was no question that Mary loved Jesus. There was no question that all of that family loved Jesus. He had done so much for them. And so Mary brought the most expensive thing that a common family would have. And she broke it open and she used all of it to show Jesus. She didn't hold anything back from Jesus. She wasn't going to save anything for the future because Mary was the first one to realize that the future was about to run out for Jesus on this earth. She was the first disciple to realize that Jesus was about to die. And so she wasn't going to hold anything back. She was offering Jesus everything, even her hair, to try to show him how much that she loved him. That was a very special moment in Jesus' life and was certainly a special moment for Mary. Others got mad at her for using something so expensive. They told her, how dare you do this? We could have sold that for a year's salary and, and, and given it to the poor. Mary didn't care because nothing was more important to her than making sure Jesus knew the place that he held in her heart. It's a good lesson for all of us. And today we're coming here not only to remember that lesson, but to look toward another lesson, a less pleasant lesson. Our scripture lesson today comes from Mark 14, verses 10 and 11. Let me read this to you. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the 12 disciples, went to the leading priest to arrange to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted when they heard why he had come, and they promised to give him money. So he began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus. It's a sad passage of scripture. Let's watch this video right now. I thought he was the one. We all thought he was the one. Everyone did. There was a party, and we were all, we were all there, and, and some woman comes in, and she has a bottle of perfume, a, expensive perfume, and she just pours it all over him. She did that because she thought he was the one. What a waste. We could have sold that perfume and used the money for a greater purpose. I tried to tell him as much, but he came back at me insinuating that he was the purpose. Even so, I believed he was the one. I believed that he was gonna turn everything upside down. I, 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 just, I just knew it. I mean, people would have followed him anywhere. All he had to do was just say the word, but he wouldn't say the word. Instead, he, my time has not yet come. That's what he would say over and over to me. My time has not yet come. Are you kidding me? He was raising people from the dead for crying out loud. He was healing the blind, producing food out of thin air. My time has not yet come. So I forced his hand. I made his time come. Things needed to push, and I was the only one that had the courage to do it. We were all up there eating. We were all up there. He looks across the table to me, and he says, get on with it. How, how did he know what I was going to do? It wasn't about the money. It was not about the money. It's just when you have that kind of power that he has, why wouldn't you leverage it to forward, to forward the agenda? People listen to him. You know the sound a wave makes after it hits the shore? and how quiet it gets after a few seconds. 
when it stops. That was Jesus. When he spoke, it was like a, a rolling wave. And the crowds listening, they were the hush at the end of the wave. Because when he spoke and you were there in his presence, there was no doubt in anyone's mind he was the one. I done let me give you a question that's bothered Christians for 2,000 years how could somebody betray Jesus who had walked with Jesus for three years and who had seen all of the things that Jesus had done for everyone that he had touched, everyone he had come in contact with. Judas had been with Jesus for three years. He had seen him do marvelous things time after time after time. How could he betray someone who had loved the world the way Jesus had loved it? Jesus trusted Judas. He had invited Judas to be one of his disciples. He, he saw the potential that Judas had in his life. And Judas had the same opportunities that all of the other disciples had had. He had had those opportunities right down to the very end. Jesus personally served Judas the Lord's Supper that last night of his life. And even when Judas came to the garden to betray Jesus, even when he brought those soldiers to the garden to betray Jesus into their hands, Jesus looked at Judas and he said, friend, why are you here? Jesus still called Judas a friend even though he knew what Judas was doing. He wanted Judas to know what was the place that he held in Jesus's heart even if Judas was doing the wrong thing. He wanted Judas to know how much he thought of him and the way that he thought of him even if Judas was going to betray him. Judas had the opportunity. In fact, Judas had opportunity after opportunity to make the right choice in this situation, but Judas didn't do that. So the questions that we need to ask today are why? And what can we learn from Judas that can help us to make the right choices down the road in our lives? The answer to the why part of this question is pretty easy. Judas had great expectations of the Messiah and he wanted to be part of those great expectations. I don't know how many of you have ever read Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Tipping Point, but it's one of the best books that I've ever read. I like all of his books, but that one is one of my favorites. Gladwell's premise in that book is that everything from the great moments of history to the everyday experiences that we have in life all come through tipping points that set the direction of what's going to happen after that. For instance, I can tell you right where I was when Jesus Christ came into my life and I literally measure my life as before that day and after that day. I can tell you right where I was when Jesus called me into the ministry and that tipping point set the trajectory for the rest of my life. I can tell you right where I was when my friend Johnny Pierce convinced me 
to go to Berry College. He convinced me that it would be the right place for me. He was a year ahead of me in school. He had gone to Berry. He convinced me that that is where I needed to go and he was absolutely right. It was one of the best choices I ever made. I can tell you right where I was when Susan Harris said yes to my proposal of marriage and that was the best thing that ever happened to me. I can tell you right where I was when, once again, Johnny Pierce convinced me that I needed to go to Southeastern Seminary in Wake Forest to go to grad school. I was looking at a lot of other places, but Johnny convinced me that Southeastern would be the right place for me, and that tipping point, that choice, opened door after door after door for me for the next three decades. I can tell you right where I was when George Hawkins called me about the possibility of coming to Blacksburg, Virginia to be the pastor of this church. That was a tipping point that changed the rest of my life and I have just been excited about it for the rest of my life. It doesn't matter whether it's a spiritual issue or a personal issue or a business issue or an educational issue or a family issue. There are tipping points that come to us in life and the decisions that we make in those tipping points are going to determine what happens next and maybe what happens to the rest of our days. I don't know what the tipping point was for Judas when he made the wrong choice in his life, but what I do know is when that tipping point came, Judas made a decision that would turn him into the greatest example of a missed opportunity in history. And I think Judas made those decisions based on the great expectations that he had for the Messiah that actually turned out to be false. Judas was just like everybody else in Israel. That nation had been waiting for a thousand years for the Messiah to come who was going to set God's people free and who was going to reestablish the, the kingdom of Israel on earth. And they thought they knew what that Messiah was going to look like and what he was going to be like. They thought he was going to be a great warrior who was going to come riding into, into the country on a white horse and he was going to bring the power of God to do battle with the Romans and he was going to run the Romans out of Israel and he was going to become the king of Israel that they had always wanted. They thought they knew what that Messiah was going to look like. The things had been upside down in Israel for a very long time. It was time for them to be right side up again. And Judas thought he had found the man who was going to do it. Judas had been with Jesus for three years. He had seen the miracles that Jesus had done. He had listened to Jesus preach and he had never met anybody who could turn a word the way Jesus could turn one. Jesus' teachings were utterly amazing to Judas and to everybody else who heard them. The clearer it became to Judas that, that Jesus was the Messiah as he listened to what Jesus had to say to the world. He was the man that Judas had been waiting for. He was the man that Israel had been waiting for. Judas had been there when Jesus had preached that great sermon on the mount. Judas was there at the wedding at Cana when Jesus took 120 gallons of plain old water and he turned them into 120 gallons of the best wine that anybody had ever had. Judas was with Jesus when Jesus took five loaves of bread and two fish that was a little boy's lunch and he fed over 5,000 people with it. Judas was with Jesus when he raised their friend Lazarus back from the dead. He was standing right there when Jesus looked at that tomb and he yelled, Lazarus, come forth. And all of a sudden, this dead man came walking out of a tomb, still wearing his grave clothes. He didn't see Jesus do those things. He was part of Jesus' doing those things. He was with Jesus when Jesus did all of those miracles. He saw Jesus' blessings over and over and over again. So Judas knew Jesus had the power that they needed to become the kind of king that they wanted. 
if Jesus would just start the war, Rome wouldn't have a chance against Jesus, against God's power. But the problem was, Jesus never started the war. After Jesus fed 5,000, there were thousands more people who came to see Jesus the very next day. And after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, so many people came to that great parade on Palm Sunday that the Pharisees looked at what was happening and they said, what can we do? It seems like the whole world has gone after him. Jesus had the people right where Judas wanted them. This was the tipping point. This was the right time. This was the time to fight. But when that Palm Sunday parade was over and when Jesus had finished cleaning out that nest of thieves from the temple, he just knew Jesus was ready for the rebellion that everybody had been wanting for generations. And Jesus knew everybody was ready to follow Jesus. But instead of seizing the opportunity and starting the war, Jesus went to Lazarus' house and had dinner. As far as Jesus, Judas was concerned, it might have been the ultimate missed opportunity. And Jesus had had lots of those opportunities. In fact, it seemed like every time that Jesus had that kind of an opportunity, every time Jesus had the opportunity to do what Judas wanted and expected him to do, Jesus would just walk away and wait. And Judas was tired of waiting. Judas had great expectations of the Messiah, and that was the tipping point. The Messiah needed to step it up. It was time to fight. And if Jesus wasn't going to decide to fight on his own, Judas was going to take the bull by the horns and he was going to make him fight. He was going to create the tipping point. If Judas could set things up just right, Jesus would have to fight and then Judas would join the fight. And how do we know that that's what Judas was trying to do? Because when things didn't turn out the way Judas thought they were going to turn out, when Jesus didn't fight, when Jesus died on a cross instead of leading the war, Judas knew that he had made a mess out of everything. And so Judas went back to the priests and the Pharisees and he told them that he had betrayed innocent blood. And when he did, those people made fun of Judas. And so Judas threw those 30 pieces of silver down on the floor in front of those religious leaders. And then Judas went out and hanged himself. That's not what you do when you're betraying somebody out of hatred. It's not what you do when you're betraying somebody for personal gain. I don't believe Judas ever wanted Jesus to die on that cross, and I don't believe Judas's motive for betraying Jesus was ever money. If it had been, he could have gotten a lot more than 30 pieces of silver. I think Judas wanted to make Jesus move forward. I think he wanted him to get with the program. He wanted Jesus to fight. He wanted Jesus to live up to his expectations. He, he wanted him to get rid of the Romans. He wanted him to become the king so Judas and his friends could become part of the king's cabinet. He wanted to be part of the royal court. He wanted power and prestige. He wanted to be part of the kingdom of Israel. He wanted all of them to do good for Israel. He wanted to serve the king. Judas had great expectations for the Messiah and Jesus wasn't moving fast enough. So Judas was going to push things along. But what he did was he got Jesus killed. He got Jesus beaten. And then when nothing turned out the way he thought it would, Judas gave up before the end 
of the story. If Judas had just waited three more days, the resurrection would have been a gift to Judas just like it was a gift to all of the rest of the disciples. Yes, Judas had done a terrible thing, but so had Peter. Peter denied Jesus three times and, and then he ran away and he hid while Jesus was dying. The rest of the disciples did the same thing. The only ones who stayed with Jesus at the cross was John and the women. The rest of the men ran away and they hid. They hid when Jesus needed them the most. But when the resurrection came, it was the gift of grace. It was a gift of grace for all of those disciples, for all of those sinners. And it would have been a gift of grace to Judas just like it was to all of the rest of them if Judas had just not have given up. I'm not like a lot of ministers in this world. I truly believe that Judas loved Jesus and, and I believe that he knew that he wanted the best for Jesus, but he also knew that his choices at the tipping point had caused Jesus's suffering and it had caused Jesus's death. Nothing turned out the way Jesus, Judas expected it to turn out. And now Judas thought he was the worst sinner that had ever lived on the face of the earth. And he probably was. And so Judas gave up and he went out and he hanged himself. And when he did, he guaranteed that he would become the greatest example of human failure in human history. In fact, Judas became such a villain in the eyes of history that until this day, it's illegal to name your child Judas in Germany and in most of the countries of Eastern Europe. And if you do name your child Judas in the countries of Eastern Europe, the Orthodox Church won't baptize your child. That's how demonic the world sees Judas, and that's sad. Because when it comes right down to it, Judas wasn't really that different from any of the rest of us. He wasn't any worse than we are. Yes, Judas did a terrible thing, but everybody betrays Jesus in one way or the other, at one time or the other. Judas didn't have a corner on sin and he didn't have a corner on betrayal. We all have that problem because we all have a Judas gene in our spiritual and in our emotional DNA. We're all prone to make the wrong choices, choices that can damage everything around us. For instance, of all the sins that we humans can commit, betrayal is probably the top of the heap when it comes to the damage that it can do to our lives and to the lives of the people around us. Betrayal can destroy marriages, it can destroy families, it can destroy friendships, it can destroy churches, it can destroy communities, it can destroy nations. Betrayal is a demon and it damages everything and everyone that it touches. I've used Corey Ten Boom as an example of heroic faith on many occasions because she's one of my heroes of the faith. Just in case you don't know who she is, Corey Ten Boom and her family were Christians who hid their Jewish neighbors from the Nazis during World War II, and they kept literally hundreds of Jews from being sent to the Nazi death camps until they were betrayed to the German Gestapo by a Dutch citizen, and then they were sent to one of those camps. Not long before she died, Corey Ten Boom was being interviewed, and and when the, the interviewer asked her what was the worst part of that experience in her life, the interviewer thought that Corey was going to say the deaths of her sister and her father, but that's not what Corey said. Corey said the worst part was when I discovered that we were betrayed to the Gestapo by a family friend. She said we would have trusted that person with anything, but they betrayed us to the Gestapo for money. At least for me, that was worse than anything else. Betrayal is a monster. It can wreck the strongest people and it can make even the most Christian person bitter. 
Judas is seen as the worst of all sinners, not because he was worse than any of the rest of us, but because he betrayed the best that God had to offer to his world. He betrayed God's own son. He betrayed a man who loved everybody he met. Judas came to a tipping point and he made the wrong choice. What is our tipping point? When we have the opportunity to count for Jesus or to not count for Jesus, to choose Jesus or to not choose Jesus, to stand up for Jesus or not, what are we going to decide when we come to a tipping point like that? What's going to guide us when we come to our tipping points? In 1992, I had the opportunity to become the pastor of a very prestigious church, a church where President Jimmy Carter served as a deacon when he was the governor of Georgia. This church was sitting right in the middle of one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in all of the South. It looked like a dream come true, but from day one, I had this nagging sense that it was the wrong church for me. And the further I went, the worse I felt, but I let the pain of a past situation, a past rejection, and my own ego get in the way of my choices, and I based my choice at a tipping point on the wrong criteria. And the result was, I never had a really good day as the pastor of that church in five years. And my family and I all suffered for five years because I used the wrong criteria for making a decision at a critical tipping point in my life. What's the point? Well, there are really two points here. The first one is, whatever choice you make, God can turn it into a blessing if you'll let him turn it into a blessing. That church was a tipping point and I made the wrong choice for the wrong reasons. But the difference in Judas and me was that I didn't give up. I trusted that mistake to God. I put that mistake in God's hands and God turned that bad choice. He took that bad choice and he turned it upside down right in front of me. It was an opportunity that came my way. It was an opportunity that did in fact fit my gifts and my personality. And the result of that opportunity, the result of my choices that were based on good criteria was that I ended up in Blacksburg, Virginia as the pastor of this church. And this has been one of the best things that ever happened to me. God can take your choices and he can turn them into miracles if we'll offer him our hearts and our faith. The second point is never give up on God, never. Judas gave up because he thought God was done with him. He thought his life was totally hopeless. But here's the right side up good news of Easter. Nothing and no one is ever hopeless with God. Nothing and no one is ever hopeless when it comes to the love of God for us. Jesus never gives up on what he loves. He didn't give up on Judas. He kept calling him friend, hoping he would make a different choice. And he never gave up on his disciples. He kept believing that they would come back and and they would be empowered by his grace and they would go out and become everything that he had dreamed of them being. And Jesus was right. And he's right about us as well. Jesus is for us. He's on our side. He believes in us even when we're finding it hard to believe in him. And there is nothing in this world that Jesus won't forgive. 
No matter what our sin has been, no matter what our betrayal has been, no matter what we've done, there's nothing that Jesus won't forgive and there's nothing that he can't turn upside down and make it right side up if we'll just ask Jesus for his help. Let's pray together. Lord, I ask you to help us to never give up on you. You've promised that you would never give up on us, that you would always be on our side. Lord, help us to believe that. Help us to come to you today and say, Father, I know I've made my mistakes. Sometimes I've made terrible choices. I've had good opportunities and I've turned them into bad experiences. I'm asking you, Lord, to forgive me of my sin, to come into my heart, to empower me to be the person you have always wanted and dreamed of me being. Come and live inside my life today. Make your home in my heart and show me the way, Lord. Help me to choose you as the criteria for the rest of my life and help me to become all that you dream of me being. Help us, Lord to be more like you today and help us to join you in trying to turn this world upside down so it can finally be right side up the way you always have wanted it to be. In your name I pray. Amen. Calvary's love will sail forever, bright and shining, strong and free, like an ark of peace and safety on the sea. sailing on their own, finally rest inside the shadows, cast by Calvary's love across their souls. Calvary's love, Calvary's love, priceless gift Christ made us worthy of the deepest sin can't rise above Calvary's love Calvary's love can heal the spirit Life has crushed and cast aside and redeem till heaven's promise fills with joy once empty eyes. So let's desire to tell the story of a love that loved enough to die it burns away all other passion and fed by calvary's love becomes a fire calvary's love calvary's love 
priceless gift Christ made us worthy of. The deepest sin cannot rise above Calvary's love. Calvary's love has never faltered all its wonders still remain souls still take eternal passage sins atone and heaven gain our sins atone and heaven gain heaven gain 